So you're thinking of retiring and moving aboard a boat. Well, here's some pros and cons from a dude who's been doing just that for the last 22 years and plans on staying here for the rest of his life. <laughs> Well, we don't wear skimpy bikinis. Hell, it frightens me when I take my shirt off. There's definitely no one pregnant here. This is motor sailing for old dudes. We do live on a boat, and we do cruise extensively along the Australian coast. Join us and visit some great destinations. Learn how to look after a boat and live off grid. It might even get you enthused to do the same thing. Hey, stay out there till you can't. What do I like about the uh, liverboard lifestyle? Well, first of all, it's the freedom, I guess. Um, being retired, uh, you've got plenty to do on a boat. Uh, there's always little jobs to do, keeping it clean, doing a little bit of maintenance, but the freedom of moving the boat from one position to another, having a different outlook uh, every day or two, I like that. It's, I think it's the last uh, place where you can have true fr freedom is out on the water, especially if you've got your boat set up to uh, be anchored most of the time and not in marinas. It's a very free and easy lifestyle. I love the boating community. Um, the community is fantastic. Everyone in boats, they're all on the same wavelength. Uh, if anyone's in trouble, there's someone there to help. If you break down, there'll be someone there with parts or maybe um, some smarts uh, to help you get out of that situation. And the boat, boating community in Australia, and I guess in the States, is all about uh, helping other boaties. So it's a great community. The relaxation, I'm always relaxed on the boat, even if I'm traveling somewhere. It's a lot easier taking the boat from one place to another, more relaxing than getting in a car and driving interstate or something like that. I'm, I figure that in the car, you're always a little bit on edge because it's a bit stressful driving. There's a lot of other cars on the road and they're passing pretty close uh, in most circumstances. So um, on a boat, uh, there's usually a bit more uh, area between vessels and it's just relaxing especially if you're only doing five or six knots um, it's a very relaxing lifestyle i love it security is something that uh, i really feel good about living on the boat too i'm anchored at the moment uh, i'm not very far off a jetty at paradise point but i've got a moat all the way around the boat so my boat is totally uh, encompassed by water. So if anyone wants to get out to my home, they have to swim or get in a tender or dinghy to come out. And that just makes it a little bit harder for um, people to come aboard and maybe cause a nuisance. You see so much on the news these days of home invasions, people stabbed, people shot and killed. And I just like uh, having that little bit of a moat around me. In most circumstances, um, I don't choose to stay overnight on any jetties or pontoons because you lose that bit of security. The other thing is if you tie up to jetties and pontoons, there's usually someone down there fishing off them and they usually have a chat while they're fishing and keeps you awake half the night. So I'd much rather be out in the pick and uh, just enjoying life with that bit of security around you. I love the adventure. I've travelled up and down the Australian coast probably 10 more times now. Um, at least 10 times. But every time I go somewhere, I seem to be able to find another spot that I've never visited before. And the adventure side of it, once you learn to navigate, and we've got GPS and really good echo sounding equipment these days, if you take it easy and sneak into different little places, it can be really a buzz getting in there, having navigated your way in, and you can find some magnificent little places uh, if you just have a look and get off the beaten track. I love that adventure side of it as well. I love the simplicity of living on a boat. Yeah, sure, you'll need tools, but you don't need many clothes. Clothes are one thing you won't need much of. Uh, my wardrobe's quite small. I use a rot what I call a rotation system with clothes. Uh, I don't usually buy clothes if I want them. I buy them if I need them. 
So if I've worn out a few clothes, I'll go and buy some new ones. Maybe I'll buy two shirts. When I buy those two shirts, when I get them back to the boat, I've got to take two shirts out of my hanging locker that are pretty well worn out. What I do with them, I put them in another locker uh, and that's my work clothes. So these are clothes that I use to polish the boat. Maybe when I'm anti-fouling, you go through a few clothes doing that. It's a very dirty job. Um, but you've got work clothes you'll use. Now, once they've gone past the work clothes stage, I still don't throw them out. I put them in the rag bag because you can't have too many rags on a boat. You're always looking for rags to do polishing or mop up oil. So nothing's really waste. It's not until they're filthy oily and then I have to dispose of them in the proper place. Uh, but that's how my clothes go down the line, if you like. But very small amount of clothes. I've only, I only own uh, about four pairs of shoes. I think I own two pairs of Crocs, one good pair, one work pair, and um, a pair of runners that I sometimes walk in, but I find the Crocs are good for walking in these days. And uh, the other thing is a good pair of deck shoes, and I use those for special occasions. And I do have some good clothes that I can wear to weddings and funerals, but um, it's one, one jacket and one pair of pants. They don't get worn very often, and um, I put a pair of deck shoes on with those. So your clothing really, um, especially if you're a warmer, in a warmer climate, it's virtually a t-shirt and a pair of shorts most of the time. If I travel down the south of the country, down to Tasmania, it gets quite cold down there, and you'll be looking at wearing jeans, flannelette shirts and jumpers, but still not as many clothes as you probably find in a normal household. How much does it cost? Good question. I've already done a video on that. There's a link right here. So I'll put that link up. Have a look at that. And it gives you my running costs for a year. That's all I can talk about. It's going to depend on the size of your boat and um, whether you can do a lot of the work yourself or whether you need to get someone else to do it. But have a look at that link and um, that'll explain uh, what it costs for me to live on this boat for 12 months. That was uh, for the last 12 months. So you can save a lot of money by doing things yourself. And look, YouTube is a fantastic resource for learning how to do things. Uh, any job I do on the boat, I usually pull up something on YouTube where someone else has already done it. And uh, it's a real good way of learning how to do something before you attack it. So don't be scared to have a go. Um, a lot of things on boats are quite simple. And if you've had a look at how it's done, you might be able to do it yourself. If you're going to get tradies involved, it's going to cost you money because I think uh, trades, as far as boating goes, are usually on the high end of, um, of what it's going to cost. And I'd say if you're going to get tradies in, you're going to be looking at $100 an hour minimum, I'd say, for uh, boat, boat trades people. So have a crack at doing it yourself. It's uh, very rewarding and uh, not impossible. Do you live on your boat in a marina or out at anchor? Well, I own a marina berth, and we'll talk about that later on, but I'd prefer to be out at anchor. I'd prefer to be traveling as well. I'd rather be cruising up and down the coast than staying in one spot. At the moment, I'm a little bit um, stuck in what they call the broad water here uh, between the Gold Coast and Brisbane. It's a great waterway, a bit like a small intercoastal waterway for you guys in the States, but um, it's all calm water. I've been here mainly catching up with some medical appointments I had and the last thing I've got to do which will happen within the next month I hope is to haul the boat out and anti-foul it. I'll do it here there's some really good facilities here for doing that and that's got to happen pretty soon but then I'm going to be off up north again. When winter hits here it's not really cold but it gets down to six degrees at night and that's a bit too cold for me so I'm going to head north and I like the idea of um, moving up and down with the seasons. You can keep the climate pretty reasonable if you're prepared to travel a bit. If you do stay in a marina, it's more expensive. In Australia, you're going to be looking at probably between a thousand and two thousand dollars a month, and you will have to pay for your electricity. Uh, there might be a liverboard fee as well. Some of the marinas charge extra if you're living on the boat. So this puts the expense up a little bit. If you're out on the pick, there's no charge yet <laughs> but uh, yeah anywhere on the coast you can anchor in Australia without having to pay any sort of mooring fee 
if you pick up a mooring buoy, there can be a charge involved in that. But uh, if just anchoring, you can do that for free. Okay, a car or no car? Um, I don't know, I, I do own a car. I think it's a bit like a brick around my neck because um, I don't use it very often. Uh, it's garaged and I've got a friend who lives on a boat as well and we sort of share it. I pay the Rego insurance, he, he garages it, so it's a good deal. Uh, but I've only really, I'm only really keeping the car for later on. It's, it's an old car, but it's a good car. And um, I'm keeping it for later on. Pr may have to stay in the marina more than I like. I actually own a marina berth, so it's a freehold berth. I own it like a block of land. And it's my safety valve, if you like. So if, I'm, if I get too dottery to um, do what I'm doing on the boat, I can park the boat in the marina and hopefully that's where I finish my days. But who knows? Public transport. Public transport's pretty easy to use when you're retired because you've got all day to use it. Um, I'm anchored here at Paradise Point at the moment. Tomorrow I'm going to jump on the bus and go to the major shopping centre nearby. It's only 15 minutes away. It cost me something like $2 on the bus. And uh, I think public transport in main centres, in bigger cities, is pretty reliable and um, not too expensive. And being a senior, being retired, I get cheap fares here in Australia as well. So they look after our seniors as far as public transport goes. You can always use an Uber too. They're a bit more expensive, but buses and trains uh, are pretty good uh, in the area I am at the moment. When you get into more remote areas, it becomes a bit more of a, a problem, but um, yeah, around bigger cities and on the eastern seaboard here, usually you can find a bus to somewhere. Okay, fuel. People always ask me about fuel because my boat is not a sailboat, it's a motor sailor. It motors everywhere and I use the sail to help. So I have got an expense for fuel. Uh, when I'm running the boat, it costs me about $12 an hour, maybe $14 an hour, depending on the cost of fuel. And on the water, we are always gouged as far as fuel prices go, sometimes up to 30% more than buying fuel for your car at a garage. So uh, it's a bit of a problem here we have in Australia. But um, you need to buy fuel for your boat. The thing about it is I'm not buying fuel every day. If you're living in a house and uh, had a car, you're probably using your car every day to go to work uh, or you're using your car to go and pick the kids up from school. This is when you're not retired. If you retire and move onto a boat and you don't have the car, you don't have that expense. And your boat, you only use fuel when you're moving it from one place to the other. So I haven't put fuel in the boat since uh, January this year, early January, uh, and it's now nearly March, so the boat's still half full. So eventually I'm going to have to put some fuel in, but I'm only doing little trips around the broad water. I'm not using much fuel. When I travel again, when I move, if I move up the coast, then I will be paying maybe $500 a week for fuel to get me up the coast. But if it gets too hard paying for the fuel, I can stop in one spot. I've got my house on my back. So I can just prop in one spot, save up a few dollars, and then go again. We live off grid on boats. Um, well, most boats, boats that don't stay in marinas all the time, usually are pretty good at living off grid. This boat's set up with solar panels, lithium batteries. It's got a little gen set that I don't run. I run it once a week just to give it a run. But uh, the boat really is self-sufficient off the sun. So um, all of our um, cooking, all of our hot water, uh, everything on the boat is done by solar, and it's a great system. Apart from the cost of installing it, uh, there is no ongoing cost. Well, not for a long while. I hope the batteries see me out. I'd say I'm going to get 10 years out of them at least, uh, probably more. But um, you'd hope there's not too many ongoing costs with the system I've uh, got on. The solar panels, the old solar panels I had on went for 23 years and we're still putting uh, power out. So hopefully these ones do the same. But um, yeah, there's no actual electricity costs um, living on a boat. If you're in a house, I was talking to a mate today, he said he reckons about, um, what did he say, about $300 a week uh, to be connected to the grid in a house. So that's quite an expense.
The big expense, I guess, every year is hard standing. It's coming up for me pretty soon. Uh, every year or 18 months in the outside, you need to lift the boat out of the water, take the bar any barnacles off the bottom, uh, rub the anti-foul back, put a new coat of anti-foul on, probably put some sort of finish on your props, prop speed I use, that keeps the props going for 12 months at least, and just check your underwater appendages and probably change anodes, do things like that. It's quite an expensive undertaking to lift the boat out and put it back in and spend, say, a week on the hard stand will probably cost me about nearly $2,000. And then the anti-foul paint, I think it's up over $600 for a 10 litre can and I need two of them. So uh, the anti-foul paint itself is getting quite expensive. But it's just something you have to do to maintain the bottom of your boat. If you don't do that, you're gonna use a lot more fuel getting through the water. Okay, so traveling. Um, where are you going to travel? At sea? I like traveling at sea, I love being out there. But seasickness can be a big problem for a lot of people. And if you do get seasick, maybe this is not the life for you. I'll give you that bit of advice straight up. Because seasickness really takes the edge off uh, going to sea. I don't suffer from it and I love being out there. It's just the best place to be. It sets my soul free getting out on the ocean. But it's not for everyone. And if you do suffer from seasick, sickness, the only option you really have is to utilise areas like the um, inland, inland waterway you've got in the States or the Sandy Strait or in Australia or the broad water that I'm in here at the moment which is off the Gold Coast and Brisbane. It's quite a big waterway, there's a lot of houseboats on it, I guess they're retired people living on the water. There's a lot of other boats on it as well but uh, yeah it's a little bit restrictive because you see it all pretty quickly and I like moving a bit further, but take into account that seasickness. I've seen everything to try and guard against seasickness. Bands, scop patches, taping your toes together, eating ginger. I don't know, I think if you're prone to it, uh, it can be a real problem. So take that into account. If you get seasick, please uh, make sure that boating is the right lifestyle for you. What skills do you need to live on a boat? Well, there are a few skills involved in helming a boat and in, you're going to have to berth it and take it out of a berth. And this is probably the thing that scares people more than anything. You'll have to learn anchoring skills. You'll have to learn navigation skills. It's nowhere near as hard as it used to be because when I started bouncing around in boats, you used to have to use a paper chart to uh, navigate. And you used to fix your position by taking a fix on a couple of shore-based objects and laying them off on the chart. Now you only really knew what your position was every hour because that's, that's when you took the fix. But of course now we've got GPS, we've got really good echo sounders and depth sounding equipment. And with GPS, everyone uses GPS on their phone or in their car. And I back all my nav up on the boat, on my iPad and uh, on my phone with Navionics. So I've got a backup of all the systems that I use to navigate. And navigation is a lot easier these days and it's opening boating up to a lot more people. So don't worry about the navigation side of it. I think you can, you, you've probably got a pretty good handle on that just from driving your car with the uh, GPS on your car. And it's just a little bit different on the water. It is a skill you'll have to come to terms with, but not a big one. Helming the boat, learning to park it, that's just a matter of practice. And um, yeah, look, at, if you, as long as you do everything slow, you shouldn't get into too much trouble. What type of boat? You're gonna have a sailboat or a motorboat. Now I've covered this in another video. I'll put the link up here again. Take a look at that. I cover most things um, as far as what type of boat you really need. So have a look at that link. That's a good little video and uh, that'll help you maybe make a decision. The biggest thing you've got going for you if you're retired and move onto a boat is you've got time. So you've got plenty of time to do anything. You've got plenty of time to learn how to use the boat. And look, uh, the other thing I'd like to mention, be a bit wary of whether your partner is as keen as you to move on the boat and live that lifestyle because a lot of women follow but don't really like it. And if they don't really enjoy it, maybe they get seasick, you don't. That's a recipe for disaster right there because they won't want to be on the boat when you're enjoying yourself and they're throwing up 
uh, it's not really good fun for anyone. So be aware that if you're bringing your partner on the boat, make sure they've got sea legs and they can handle it as well. An option could be there, and I've seen this uh, with a lot of couples, they keep their car, keep it on the shore somewhere. When the boat's got to go on a trip, the skipper, or the, usually the husband, takes the boat up the coast. The wife jumps in the car and drives the car up. And that's probably not a bad option because you've got the availability of a car wherever the boat is. So you can use the boat as a base and then use your car for getting around and having a look around the area. So things you can do. But um, if you're going to try and drag your wife onto it kicking and screaming, it's probably not going to last long. And you do see, me included, you do see a lot of single blokes on boat. And I guess this is why, it's, I think it's a bit of a, I think there's more blokes that like being out on the ocean than there are women. If you've got a, if you've got a lady that likes being out there, hang on to her fellas, uh, they're in short supply. The other thing with uh, being retired, you've got time to make your passages. You don't have to push weather. When I was a younger fella, I did a lot of deliveries and I used to punch weather wherever we went. Sometimes you'd have the owner on board, he'd want to be in a certain place at a certain time. I'd want to be getting the job done because it was uh, worth, you know, the, the money was better if I did it in a shorter time. And you used to punch weather, and I really didn't enjoy the, um, the uh, delivery aspect very much at all. Since I've been retired, I don't go anywhere without favourable conditions. And it makes it so much easier um, skipping up and down the coast when you've got the wind behind you, you can get the sail out. People ask me to use the sail much, but when I go to sea, I use it all the time because I never go to sea and push into the wind. I've always got the wind coming from behind. And it makes it so much more comfortable and uh, much more safe as well. So having that time with retirement is a great thing if you're going to live on a boat. Um, whatever boat you get, two things you really need is reliability and redundancy. Um, go to this link, have another look at that. Uh, I talk about engines you should use and redundancy. Redundancy just having a backup for something when it goes wrong, and it's pretty important. Uh, there's no roadside assist when you get out at sea, so if you're going to be doing miles up the coast, make sure your boat's in good nick, make sure the maintenance is up to it, and make sure you've got some other way of getting there if something goes wrong. If something goes really wrong, of course, there are rescue services. In the States, it's the Coast Guard. In uh, Australia here, we have Coast Guard in one state, Volunteer Marine Rescue in another. So there's a few different rescue agencies, but they do a top job at um, rescuing people that have broken down at sea. Touch wood, I haven't had to use them in 23 years, um, but they're there if I do need them. Now, they are very helpful. They'll give you lots of information when you're traveling up and down the coast. They're reachable on uh, radio, VHF. Uh, they're reachable on mobile phones as well. But uh, yeah, they're a great resource and makes you feel a little bit safer when you're out at sea and things can go wrong. The main way of contacting them when you're on board is your VHF radio. But communications are a pretty big thing when you're living on a boat. On the east coast of Australia, there's lots of places where you can get uh, a phone signal. So not too many places where you can't get a phone signal, but there are some. When you get in the more remote areas, uh, the phone signal drops out a bit. Three months ago, I put Starlink on this boat and it's the best thing I've done for ages. Uh, because of Starlink, I've got communications anywhere I go, virtually in the world. But the other thing is uh, for streaming videos, for me, uploading especially, uh, or downloading, um, you've got unlimited uh, access to the internet and it's uh, 100 and, in Australia it's $170 a month. Fantastic value and um, the best thing I've done for ages. Yeah, okay, so, so think about Starlink uh, on your boat, especially if you're still working or transitioning from work to retirement. With Starlink, you can have uh, the internet at your fingertips all the time. So if you're doing a bit of internet work, great way of doing it with uh, that communication pack package and it's a lot cheaper than a lot of the satellite driven options that are out there so Starlink's a real winner. If you are making the transition I think it's a good idea to learn together so go and do courses together you might want to do a, a boat handling course or a seamanship course you might want to do a mechanical course there's some good courses out there you can do and uh, if you do them together 
that keeps you both interested in the transition you're going to make. So I think that's a pretty important thing to do. If you've got a proficient partner, if your partner is proficient in handling the boat, it makes it a lot easier as a skipper. If they know how to get the anchor winch set up and drop the anchor, um, raise the anchor, you'd want to make sure that your partner is okay with helming the boat. Uh, make sure that she can get you out of trouble just in case something goes wrong with you. You don't want to leave her stranded somewhere. Make sure she knows how to use the, the chart plotter, knows how to plot in a course, knows how to get the boat back somewhere where you can get assistance. That's pretty important for uh, couples living on boats, I reckon. If you're single and don't have a partner, you might need to get crew. It'll depend on your boat. It's great if you've got a boat that you can handle by yourself. I can handle this old girl by myself, not a problem. But it's always easier when you've got crew on board. And getting crew can be a big problem because there's crew and there's crew. So if you are going to get crew on your boat, the only thing I can suggest is have the understanding with anyone you put on the boat. There's a week's trial period. Make sure you get on with them. Make sure they get on with you. So try it out for a week. If it all works, keep them on board and go and do some travel. Uh, dipping your toe in the water. You're going to sell the house and buy the boat? Are you keeping the house and buying the boat? Are you keeping the house and chartering a boat to try it out? Are you keeping the house and doing a boat share for a few years to see if you like it? Are you owning a marina berth? These are all things you can do. I'd say selling the house and buying the boat is probably the most dangerous thing you can do because if you do that, all of a sudden you're locked into living on the boat. Why is that? Because the house you've sold is going to accrue value. Your boat, in most circumstances, will not. So I would never advise anyone to sell their house to buy a boat and go cruising because it's just a recipe for disaster. I haven't seen many, but I've seen a few people that are stuck living on a boat when they really don't want to, and they can't afford to get back into the housing market. So be very careful of that. It's very important. Keeping the house and buying the boat, if you can afford it, if you can keep the house and buy a boat, even if it's a smaller boat, it'll get you out in the water. You'll learn lots, and it might not be the boat that you can retire on. It might be too small, but you'll learn heaps on that little boat, and you'll have a good time learning together and uh, you can put those skills into practice when eventually you do retire and maybe then sell the house and buy a boat to live on. I bought a marina berth and it's a freehold marina berth so I'm not paying rent on it, I have to pay a body corporate fee but I own the berth outright. The good thing about that is it is an asset in real estate. It's not accruing as much value as a house would but it is accruing value and the thing is it's always there. And I found that in the last five years, marina berths are getting really hard to come by. So I'm glad that I've got that berth because I don't want to get to the stage where I can't take the boat up the coast and do the traveling I want to do. And I've got nowhere to keep the boat if I want to put it in a marina berth. Maybe I've got medical problems and have to see doctors all the time. It's just a bit of an insurance policy against uh, having nowhere to keep the boat. If I had to go to hospital. I couldn't really leave the boat just anchored here and think it was all right. I, I couldn't leave it that way, but I've always got the marina berth. I can put the boat in the berth or the slip, you call it in the States. I've got that slip. I can put the boat, boat in there and go and do time in hospital. Touch wood, that doesn't look like happening soon. So um, we'll keep on traveling, but I've got that berth there just in case. And I think it's a pretty good insurance policy. I talked to a couple last week up in Moreton Bay. They follow my vids and it's given them a lot of uh, impetus to go cruising when they retire. And uh, for them to get their smarts, what they've done, they've taken a 10% share in a little Inspiration 42, I think it was, uh, a lovely little powerboat. So they've got a 10% share in that. They get to use it 10% of the time, I guess. Um, but they're getting their smarts by having this share boat. Now, when they're finished, work they're only younger people they're only in their 50s I think um, but when they come to retirement age when they're ready to retire they'll probably sell their share in the in the share boat 
and that may have accrued value, may not have, uh, not sure, but um, when they sell their share, then they can go and buy a boat that they're going to cruise on. So I think that's a really good plan. At least um, they're, they're out there boating and learning the ropes, and um, I think it's a great way of doing it if you can afford to buy shares. And there's a lot of share boats around now, so you could buy shares in a sailboat. They've bought shares in a power boat. I think it's a great way of getting your feet wet and getting into the boating game. Uh, the other thing you can do, instead of selling the house and buying a boat, keep your house and maybe charter a boat. It'll be expensive. Charter a boat for a month. You need to do it for a month, but find a good place somewhere that you'd like to uh, have a holiday. Charter a boat for a month and try it out. If you can afford it, charter it for three months. That'll give you a better idea. But I'd much rather you do that than sell the house, buy the boat, and then not enjoy it all. If you charter a boat for a month or even th three months especially, you're going to know a lot more about boats. You're going to know a lot more what can go wrong. You're going to know how to clear a toilet when it blocks up. I can guarantee you. You're going to know why the batteries went flat overnight. You're going to learn a lot of things by chartering a boat. So that's a good way of doing it without selling the house first and jumping straight on the boat. The other thing I should mention is that how fit this lifestyle will keep you. Just launching the dinghy and getting into it, you're stretching muscles and doing yoga without even thinking about it. Winding up sails gives you uh, upper body strength and it's a very fit way of living. Okay, look, I think I've uh, just about covered everything uh, in this little vid. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, if you've got any questions, please leave me a comment. Just down here somewhere and uh, I, I'm, I pride myself in the fact that I answer any comment that comes to my little channel um, please give us a thumbs up give us a like share it with your friends if you think it's worthwhile and uh, subscribe that'd be fantastic I hope you've enjoyed it look the only thing I can guarantee if you can make the transition to living on a boat I think you'll love it it's a fantastic lifestyle you'll meet lots of fantastic people out in the water and it's a really laid back relaxing way of enjoying your retirement okay dudes thanks for the time see you out in the water don't forget stay out there till you can't